Well, greetings and welcome to The Dividing Line. It is uh, a very unusual program today. I'm at home, as you can see. Um, and I mentioned on Twitter a little while ago, just uh, thankful that uh, my dear wife has turned the corner on uh, on COVID. It has been uh, been quite a battle, uh, but um, that's why I've been uh, been home. That's, uh, that's your job. And um, uh, evidently, I can't get this stuff. I've been exposed to it hundreds and hundreds of times. And now I've been in the same house with it uh, for days and days and days. It just doesn't like me. Um, which I don't feel badly about. I'll be honest with you. That's that's okay. If we if we can't have a relationship, that's it's perfectly fine. Anyway, <clears throat> uh, when Jesus told the disciples, uh, when he asked them, "Do you have a sword?" and they said, "We have two. and Jesus said, "It is enough. What what kind of a sword would they have had? Well, it wouldn't have been exactly like this. Uh, this is somewhat curved. Um, this is more of a samurai type, um, Asian type, but it probably would have been about the same length. Um, there were Roman short swords. You all have seen the Roman short sword in the uh, background of the dividing line. If you I've got my claymore back there, and then I have a Roman short, short sword from the movie Gladiator. If you've watched that, when uh, Maximus uh, pulls his second, his backup sword uh, during the cavalry charge in that first battle, uh, that's the sword in the back. It's not the same one, obviously, but problem. Um, anyway, um, so this would this was a means of uh, protection. Um, obviously, Jesus wasn't uh, planning for the disciples to be trying to take over uh, the Roman Empire or something uh, by force, uh, but there was a recognition of the need for self-protection. That was all it was had at that particular point in history. Um, Gunpowder would be first invented, as far as I am aware, in the East and would eventually come to the West. Uh, You'd have cannon and then eventually the development of forms of firearms. And there has been a continuous uh, evolution over time uh, of the firearm from the muskets that you saw in the movie Patriot, for example, uh, with Mel Gibson running through the trees and <clears throat> uh, doing, doing his thing, smoothbore muskets uh, that would fire a, a shot. I, I knew I'd forget. To, ah, good. I do have it here. They would fire a round ball. You saw him melting down his dead son's toy soldiers to make these round balls uh, that would go down a smooth bore. And obviously they were very long uh, because uh, that was the only thing that gave any kind of aim. Um, the, the pistols that they had, to be honest with you, they wouldn't be accurate past five or six meters uh, because there'd be so much variability in where that round ball would go because it wouldn't be spinning. Eventually, people figured out, wow, if it's spinning, it it, uh, it goes in a straight line. So hmm. uh, then the development uh, of grooves in the bore uh, to cause spinning. And then by the time you get to the Civil War, this is um, a round from the Battle of Gettysburg. I used to live in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, and my mom would take me out of school, and uh, we would go walk the fields of Gettysburg and visit Devil's Den and Little Round Top and Pickett's Charge and everything else, and this is a huge 50 caliber, so that means it's half an inch wide, uh, 50 caliber lead slug. And once again, um, becoming more and more accurate uh, with rifled barrels. The North had better, had much more manufacturing than the South did and had significantly better rifles. It wasn't, it was during the Civil War, you you start getting cartridges being made where the slug is placed inside a cartridge. And so you can load much faster, you can fire much faster. Um, But of course, those were all advancements that took time to 
end up in the field. Um, until you get to where we are today, where you have sniper rifles, we have sniper rifles that can make shots over a mile away um, and all the things associated with it. So anyway, uh, what does any of this have to do with uh, <clears throat> Jesus and swords and anything else? I have been watching the media coverage of what happened in Uvalde yesterday, the uh, tyrant of Canada, um, who evidently just has unlimited power. He just can do whatever he wants to do. Uh, I thought there was this charter of freedoms in Canada, but we're discovering that things like that are only as good as the paper they're printed on. Um, uh, decided to freeze all uh, handgun ownership in uh, the nation of Canada. Uh, historically, these actions have always uh, happened in, in a certain fashion, in, in the sense of eventually disarming the public. You don't just do it one day. Um, you, you do one step, then the next step, then the next step, then the next step. As I am watching the discussion in the United States, I am astonished at the ignorance of our leaders and our people on the subject of firearms. I, just, just pure, it's either abject ignorance, and there is a lot of that, there is a lot of that, um, or it's just massive dishonesty. And there is certainly a, a fair amount of that as well. We are not to be people who are ignorant. We're not to be people who uh, lie. I also know, and have talked about in the program before, that we have friends outside of the United States. We have lots of people who watch this program outside the United States. We have a global audience, and we're very thankful for that. And my conversations when I was able to travel globally have always been interesting on this subject. I have said before, I remember sitting outside at a picnic table during a Bible conference in Australia. And a fellow from New Zealand was sitting next to me and, and he said, I, I just cannot understand American evangelicals fascination with guns. And I, I sort of quickly asked, well, let me just ask you, do you trust your government? He said, implicitly. And I said, that's the difference between us. Um, I know a government is made up of Romans 1 individuals multiplied over and over again. And uh, so I don't trust my government. And that is why our founding fathers gave us the freedom uh, and the responsibility of being able to own arms uh, so that tyranny, which they had just finished fighting, um, would have a level of resistance against him. And he just didn't, he couldn't get it. He might get it now, especially if he lives in places like Melbourne, stuff like that. Um, over the past couple of years, I have had brothers in multiple foreign nations communicate with me privately. Normally, those mechanisms allow you to communicate privately in an encrypted form <clears throat> that they recognize now uh, the advantage that we have in the United States. They didn't, they didn't get it before. They get it now. As they see tyranny, as they see armed thugs um, locking them in their houses or threatening to come into their houses, and inject poisons into their arms and their children's arms. When I had someone say to me, man, I, I, I get it now. I, I, I get it. Um, the thought crossed my mind. They said, you know, I wonder if they got their, if, if, if they didn't get the, all the messaging straight and if, they're going to have to go back and take care of this problem before they can then finish off what they've started uh, with the uh, complete subjugation of the American people to tyranny and the enslavement of the American people. Uh, because once 
once the regime um, can tell you where to go, what to dress, what to eat, where you can travel, when you can work, and then take over your bloodstream, um, that's called slavery. That's called slavery. And that would be a just punishment, but that's up to God, not up to us. And right now there's a great argument and discussion going on amongst Christians about uh, Christians and rights and liberty and freedom. And aren't we supposed to be slaves of Christ? Yes, we are. Um, are we supposed to stand for truth and righteousness and rescue the perishing? Yes, we are. How does all that work? Boy, it's a big conversation, isn't it? But it shouldn't be a conversation that is marked by abject ignorance. Joe Biden, who is not, has never been a smart man. He has never been a smart man. Just read the records. The man was caught lying so many times when he was running for president in the past. Um, and if you haven't watched the videos of him claiming things, this was long before senility. You know, now you can just excuse it because he is clearly mentally incompetent. And, and if you don't think he's mentally incompetent, I, I wonder about you. It's just so obvious and plain now. But even before that, the, the man didn't know how to be an honest person for a lot of money. He, he bailed out of one of the races because he was caught just lying through his teeth. It doesn't matter anymore. That's just the politics is now. Anyway, he's standing in front of uh, reporters, I think yesterday, maybe the day for this one. And he's talking, and, and of course, Uvalde, and I don't know what's going on down there. Did you hear that they swore the guy in that kept the police in stand down for 90 minutes, they swore him onto the city council behind closed doors. Yes, what is going on down there? All is not well in Uvalde, Texas. Let me tell you something, folks. Something really, how did an 18 year old kid who was part time at Wendy's get $4,000 worth of firearms? Um, hmm, 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 hmm. Anyway, um, Biden is standing there and he's talking about how a nine millimeter, now almost every secret service agent around him minimally has a nine mil. Some of them have 45s, 40s, um, as well as Uzis under their suit jackets. You wonder why they none of them ever look like they run a lot. <laughs> it's because there's a lot of, you know, uh, Neo walking into the, into the, that Neo and Trinity walking into that one place and then opening their, yeah, lots of stuff down there. Um, but he's saying that a nine millimeter uh, can blow the lung out of your body. Not mellow. Biden, when he goes off teleprompter, normally is just babbling anyways. But um, it is just so common for Americans today and for Christians to com be completely ignorant about this subject. If you've never gone shooting, and even if you have, just going out once or twice doesn't really mean a lot. There's a lot you may not know. And hence, when you are lied to, how do you know you're being lied to? How many people in the United States today would be able to, well, um, NPR, NPR posted within, uh, I think a matter of moments ago, NPR posted, quote, the AR-15 is designed to blow targets apart. Its bullets travel with such velocity that they can decapitate an adult. I don't know if any of you remember uh, a couple of years ago, uh, this New York Times reporter wrote a story about shooting an AR-15. And he talked about the massive explosion, the huge recoil and the disorientation, <laughs> all the rest of this stuff. And a lot of people had fun with it because then they'd post pictures of nine-year-old girls with an AR-15 uh, going pink, 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 because you can do that with an AR-15. 
It was just a lie. The guy had never shot an AR-15. He had no idea what he was babbling about. And when it comes to this subject, people don't care if you lie. It's perfectly fine. Because on this subject, there are so many people, even Christians, who are emotionally controlled. Well, they're just bad. You know, it's funny. We'll, we'll, we'll go to movies all the time where there are guns everywhere. Liam Neeson, you know, always pushing for gun control, and yet every single movie he does. Well, okay. Um, well, that, no, there were, there, were, there were guns even in, um, um, oh, just slipped my mind, the Scottish one. Uh, the real good one. Anyway, there were guns in there too. Um, Rob Roy. So, there, there are guns everywhere. He's constantly. But the hypocrisy knows no ways. So having seen all this ignorance and just this, these lies, um, I would like to provide you with a small amount of education that at least will allow you to recognize lies and to maybe make decisions. And I can tell you what decisions to make, but maybe make decisions based on truth rather than just being deceived by everything, by everything. Um, so um, let, let me start back here. And it, it's hard with the, okay, all right. This is a Marlin, Marlin Glenfield 60. This was, this is a, and here's, here's our first thing to learn. This is a semi-automatic rifle. Uh, recently, even Dr. Moeller, in commenting on this subject, confused semi-auto with auto. He said an AR-15 was an auto. It's not. Um, a semi-automatic rifle has a magazine. This one does not have an easily visible magazine, uh, but it does. It's right here. This is a, actually, see, see how it pulls out? This is an 18-round magazine, and there's a little spot right here. You individually put one bullet in at a time until you can fit 18 in there. Uh, you have to rack one in, and then you push this thing in, and you've got 18 rounds. This is a great rabbit hunting gun, for example. This is a this is a 22 caliber long rifle. Okay, 22 caliber long rifle, most common gun in the United States. 22 caliber. Um, this was the first firearm I purchased my own money once I got a job as a teenager in high school. And it's got a few nicks and scratches because it has been out in the desert. And what you do back then, let me let me show you a 22 caliber. This is called a 22 caliber rimfire. And go back here. Um, this rim here has a small amount of explosive in it. So when the firing pin hits that, it ignites the uh, powder in here. And then you've got about a 40 grain, 22 caliber. So it's just under a quarter inch cross lead slug that comes flying out the end of there. And 22 cal 22s are the, are the most common rifle for plinking. Going out in the desert and just uh, setting up some targets, set up some, some cans, um, <clears throat> just going out with your, your friends and plinking. And when we first moved here to Phoenix, 1974, we were way, way out in the north, north, north of Glendale. And so we could get in a car and literally in two miles, we could set up and be shooting. There was nothing out there. Today, every place, every place that we went shooting is, uh, houses, uh, shopping centers, you have to drive minimally an hour, probably more than that, uh, now to get a place to shoot in Phoenix. Back then, just go out. Uh, my sister had a Remington nylon, was it nylon 60? I don't know, it was another semi-auto. A semi-auto, sorry, I started telling history. A semi-auto 
as a magazine of some type. And when you pull the trigger, one shot goes off, but then it reloads itself normally very quickly. And you pull the trigger again, another sh shot goes off. An automatic is a weapon where you pull the trigger and you keep the trigger back and it keeps firing. Now, there are automatics that have a switch on them, for example, that will allow you to select uh, a three round burst. Uh, I've fired automatic weapons. A dear friend of mine in uh, Oklahoma took me out a few years ago, well, a number of years ago now, and um, let me fire a number of automatic weapons. And I can tell you from that experience that it's pretty much worthless to just simply pull the trigger because the bullets will go everywhere. You can't aim, but you can aim a three round burst. Uh, but as long as more than one goes out when you pull the trigger, that's an automatic. And automatics are heavily uh, regulated by the US government. Only certain people can have them. You have to have certain levels of firearms training, licensing, very expensive. Um, obviously SWAT teams and things like that have those kinds of weapons. Those are weapons of war. That's what our soldiers, our soldiers are not carrying AR-15s in the battle. They don't have semi-automatic rifles. They have automatic rifles. They have semi-automatic handguns uh, because a handgun that's automatic would be after the first round, <laughs> no longer worth anything. It's just you'd be shooting the roof because um, you just can't control it. Um, and then you have bolt action. I forgot to grab. No, no, I do have one. I'll be able to show you one. All right. You've got bolt action rifles. You have lever action rifles. If you've watched the old Rifleman series from the 1950s and 60s. Um, I can't show you one of them because the... I, I had purchased a number of firearms when I was working before I got married. Uh, but then uh, when my son was born, he was born premature. And even though we had 80-20 insurance, the 20 was a whole lot more than we could afford. And so I had to sell all my firearms. And um, over the years, I've replaced most of them. Uh, but what I haven't replaced is uh, my long barrel shotgun. I don't... I've not replaced that. And then I had a lever action Marlin 3030, and I've not replaced that either. Um, missed both of them. But uh, so there, there are single shots, uh, bolt actions, but if you have to do something to get the next round in, then that's not an auto anything. Um, and so vast majority of Americans today think the IR-15 is an automatic rifle. Um, they think that our soldiers are carrying them into battle. They're not. Um, and the vast majority of people have no earthly idea what the difference between an AR-15 is, M16, uh, M1A1, anything like that. They have no earthly idea. They may watch, um, they, they may watch movies, but they just don't know what they're watching. And not all movies are overly accurate. There are some that are incredibly accurate. Uh, Saving Private Ryan, for example. Um, there you saw what our soldiers carried, and, and they, they used, they even used the, the proper rifles. And when you would, when the magazine was out, you'd hear this ping, because they would kick the kick it out. And uh, it was incredibly realistic. They, they invested a lot of effort in that. Anyway, so I started off with a little 22. Uh, actually, my, my dad had... Uh, a Marlin 22 from the 1880s octagon barrel that had been a lever action, but the magazine didn't work anymore. You could single load it. And I, I think that was the first one that I shot. Yeah, it was, I think it was. Uh, and then I got this Marlin, which I, which I still have 18 rounds. So you pull the trigger 18 times and 18 bullets fire out. And of course the bullets are firing outside these brass here ends up on the ground. I am sure there are some people up in the north part of this valley that when they mow their lawns are still <laughs> kicking up some of my old brass from <laughs> 35, 40 years ago um, <clears throat> because uh, it, it's it's still out there. 
So um, with that, let me, let me show you, um, um, well, let's, let's, well, let me show you the next, next one that I got. This is um, the, this is a lever action. So you can see you, you put the uh, cartridges in here and you put them into the firing chamber with a, with a lever action uh, here. Um, this is a 30 out six. I, this is one of the most beautiful rifles. Let me get up there so you can see it. I know the lighting isn't really good in here to show this, but um, I bought this in 1981. In fact, there is a picture. I was going to bring it up and I forgot. I apologize. I have posted it in the past. There is a picture of this rifle sitting on a table um, open like this, um, laying on a table, sorry about that, uh, in the auditorium of Independence High School, where I was a senior at the time. And it was the prop we used for the trial of Lee Harvey Oswald. So I walked that morning into my high school carrying this gun. And nobody said a word about it. No one thought twice about it. Nobody panicked. No cops showed up. Um, because that was 1981. And this was this was the if you know the Kennedy assassination, the actual rifle is a Manlicker Carcano 6.5 millimeter. This is a 30 out six. So, but hey, it was what it was. This is much, much, much nicer, I assure you, um, than the Manlicker Carcano. I did eventually buy a Manlicker Carcano. I don't have it anymore. Um, but I bought this for my dad for his birthday. This was my dad's gun, but I bought it for him. And it is one of the most beautiful rifles I've ever seen. And uh, he's gone. And so I, I have the 30 out six uh, after all this time. This would be an excellent deer rifle. Um, uh, it's a mid range hunting rifle. Very, very common caliber, 30 out six. Very, very, very common. Uh, as you can see, it has a scope. I think it's three rounds, maybe four. I've forgotten. I'd have to, I'd have to put some rounds in there to find out. Um, but yeah, we used this as a, as a prop in the trial of Lee Harvey Oswald in my high school. Nobody died. Nobody panicked. Um, yeah, that's, that's how that one works. Now, this one is the biggest one that I will show you. Biggest as in size. So tell me, does, um, if you're scared by guns, Shouldn't this scare you a lot? That's a tripod down here, so I can fold the legs down, see it like that, and set it up like that. And it's got a big old barrel and a nice big scope on it. And so this must be a really, really dangerous rifle, right? So we, we should ban these, right? Well, keep this one in mind. Keep that in mind a second. I'm trying to... And let me show you this one. Look familiar? Yeah. This is an AR-15. This is the big bad boy. This is uh, what NPR just recently said. The AR-15 AR is designed to blow targets apart. Its bullets travel with such velocity that they can decapitate an adult. Now let's let's help the let's help NPR out some. The vast majority of AR-15s fire what's known as the 5.56 millimeter round. In English notation, that's 223. The big, huge rifle I just showed you are the same thing. Same round. Exact same round. So when people look at something and they go, oh, that looks dangerous, that is the equivalent of a sniper rifle. This is not. Notice how much shorter the barrel is. With 
that 223, 5.56, exact same, exact same rounds. I can write my name at 200 yards like that. It's got a great scope on it, super accurate. And so I could literally put JW on a on a target at 200 yards with that thing. Couldn't do that with this because it's not designed for that. But it's the same round. Now, if I were to ask most in the voting public today, if, if I were to show you two rounds here, um, I wonder how many people in the voting public would be able to identify what, what goes in an AR-15. Now, there are, you can chamber AR-15s for other calibers, but the vast majority are 223s. 5.56, military round. Jacob Jones, given what NPR says, has said, given what, you, given what that New York Times reporter said, which of these two rounds do you think the AR-15 uses? Okay. Put them side by side. Which which one do you think the AR-15 uses? Well, you can probably guess. It's this one. That's an AR-15 round. 223, 5.56 millimeter. Readily available all around the world. Normally 60 grain bullet. Grain is standard measurement for weight of the bullet. So 60 grain bullet, and it's 0.223, so just under a quarter of an inch cross. What I showed you before, this one, is a 338 Winchester Magnum. So it's 0.338 across, so it's half again wider than the other one. That's a 220 grain slug sitting on top of a whole lot more powder. This is the round that I used over 10 years ago now to take Betsy, the black bear, who is hanging on the back of my commentary section in my office, that I shot about 45 miles outside of Wasilla, Alaska. And I've, I've told the story that because we were in a tree stand, I could not get, because she was basically at this angle, like back here, I could not get the butt of the gun on my shoulder. It was on my bicep. And so when I fired, and I did take her with one round, she never knew what hit her. Um, I had a black and blue mark on my bicep for at least five days. That's how much it punched. As I said, you can see pictures of nine-year-old girls with, with an AR-15. Bing, 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 because you're only firing a 60-grain bullet. Now, that 60-grain bullet is coming out the front end of that gun at about 3,000 feet per second. And the 338 Win Mag bullet is coming out at about 3,000 feet per second too. But one weighs over three times what the other one weighs. And so the power differential is astonishing. So if you were in the woods and a hungry grizzly bear comes roaring out of the trees at you, if you have a 223, Shooting that bear is only going to make it more angry. Even if you manage, and in a situation like that, aim <laughs> goes out the window. Um, adrenaline is not good for aim. Um, even if you manage to hit it in the head, in many instances, a slug that small, that narrow and that small, will bounce off. Might penetrate. You might as well try. You got nothing better to do. Um but you're not in good shape. Um, with a 338 wind mag, you could take the bear. Um, that, that slug is going to enter, it's gonna cross all the vitals, and yeah, you're, you're, you're probably gonna survive. 
because it's so much more powerful. It's called foot pound energy. It's the amount of energy contained in that speeding slug that can be delivered to the target. Now, um, the difference then, when you when you when you hear NPR telling you that that this can decapitate an adult, no one in NPR has a clue what they're talking about. So they're lying to you, and they don't care, and they don't know. They probably think they're telling the truth. Now, at close range, the speed with which this hits does tremendous damage. And in fact, this is probably just going to go straight through. If it only hits soft tissue, it's just going to go straight through. There's, there's probably not enough in a human being to cause the explosive effect of the, of the tip, the tip opening up and causing the explosive effect. Um, the, the 223 is a killing round. There's no question about that. But the idea it can decapitate, the 338, oh yeah, yeah, 338 can. Um, a, uh, a 50 cal, oh goodness. I forgot to grab one for you, but I was gonna show you what a 50 cal looks like. But that's a 440 grain slug. Yeah, that can decapitate. You wanna see what can decapitate? That, that's a shotgun shot. That's double lot buck. That goes in this shotgun. And let me tell you something, at close range, um, this is by far, I mean, in comparison to an air, not even close. Because I, I know you can't really see it, but there are lead balls in there. And a double lot, let's see, how many are there? Uh, three, so it's probably nine, nine or 10. Double lot buck in that. That's why you don't have to aim quite as well. Uh, if you've got smaller shot in there, you, you have to aim even less well. Um, but shotguns at close range are just um, next to impossible to survive. Because you're getting hit with the equivalent of six, seven, eight bullets at a, at a, at a time in the same spot. Or close to the same spot. Um, so they are, yikes, yeah. And uh, that can do the decapitation thing, or you know the old fifty cal from Gettysburg. Uh, those things, those things weren't going nearly as fast, uh, but they they did a massive, massive, massive amount of of damage. Um, one more to show you after, I'll just leave the sniper rifle over there. This beauty, and it is a beauty, and I only got it back. This was one that I bought before my son was born and I sold it. And then about three years ago, the guy that bought it from me uh, said, hey, would you like to buy that back? <laughs> and I said, oh yes. And he actually sold it to me with the same amount that I bought it from. He's a good friend. He was the best man at my wedding. We hadn't seen each other for years and years and years. Anyway, this is an unusual looking rifle. Let me back up. Okay. It looks shorter than the others, but the rifle, the barrel itself isn't. And the reason is there's almost no action here. This is a single shot. There's no magazine. You have to slide this in right here, okay? That's, you gotta do one shot at a time. This is a 300 Winchester Magnum. So it's a little bit smaller than the 338, but it's kicking a 180 grain boat tail out at well over 3000 feet per second. Uh, incredible range. And if you want to have some understanding of power, uh, like I said, you can you can fire the AR-15 uh, young young kids can't. You'll just feel a small a small amount of recoil. 
I remember watching my dad lying prone in the desert. He wasn't a big guy, he was a small guy, so he's, you know, we're, we're pretty much average size in the white family. And so he's laying prone in the dirt on the ground in the desert with this gun, this, this very one. And I remember watching him pull the trigger. The first thing I saw was the shock waves going out front in the dirt because he's down on the ground. So he's close to the ground. So you just see this shock wave going out from the front and quite a muzzle blast. But the thing I'll never forget, his toes, you know, his, he's, on, he's, on, he's prone, so his toes are pointing toward the ground. They're in. When you looked at the dirt, the gun physically slid him two inches back along the ground when it went off. You could just see in the, in, in the dirt where his toes, the whole, his whole body. He fired it once, stood up, handed it to me, and said, Ever again. <laughs> and I'm going to tell you, when I would take it out, um, because as a teenager, uh, I got into what's called hand loading, where you would hand load your own ammunition. And that was a lot of fun. It, uh, it required discipline. It required study. It required you to be steady to do the same thing accurately each time uh, to create accurate rounds. And I was hand loading for that thing. And I'd go out to test a new hand load because you'd test different amounts. Because when you just buy your ammo, you know, they're, they're fairly accurate, but you know, it's a machine doing it. Um, you got to go out and test it. And I would come back and my shoulder would just, oh man, just be black and blue for days uh, because the, the the kick is is impressive. Um, you know, it's a good kick on a thirty out six. Uh, certainly, the twelve gauge will kick will, will kick like a mule too, the shotgun. Um, but uh, that three hundred, and I think part of it was because there's less gun to it uh, because it's single shot. There's less weight to it. So it's just all going straight into your shoulder. It's it's a boom boom. Uh, there's there's no two ways about it. Now, those are the rifles, but much of the conversation today is about the pistols. Now, like I said, you know, twenty two, all over the place. You used to be able to buy. I, I I found this while digging around today. It's unopened. It's a hundred round, twenty two. $3.99. So this is an old box. <laughs> I looked up what a hundred is going for now and it's about 14 bucks. So what is that? 350% increase um, since whenever it was, I, I got that. Um, you can also buy what are called bricks. Here's a brick of 22. And this is what we do. You'd go buy a brick. There's 500 rounds in here. And you you go out and you and your friends, you, you target shoot and you do it responsibly. And it was, it was great fun. And, um, and I'll be honest with you. It's one of the reasons that American forces were what they were on the battlefield. Uh, if you know anything about World War II, World War I, um, American troops were deadly on the battlefield because so many of our boys had grown up shooting. They were good shots. They were good shots. They were better than the people they were taking on because there was more exposure to firearms. That's not the case anymore. I, I'm, but I mean, certainly we still have those types of folks and a lot of those folks do go in the military, but um, yeah, that's, that's really not the, the way things are anymore, sadly. Um, and so there are primarily two kinds of handguns. The most common is your standard 
revolver. Okay. And so a revolver has a cylinder and some of them actually have removable cylinders. If you know, like I used to have a, a call this was it a single six. Is that what it was called? Ruger. One of my, one of the first pistols I owned was a 22 caliber and it had a removable, but this slides out. This is a six round or is this a five? Yeah, it's a five. Uh, this is a little 30, 38 caliber. So here is a 38 caliber. And this is a hollow point. See, there's the, the, the head of it is hollow. This is a full metal jacket. Um, this would be more for plinking. This is more for self-defense. So they're cost a little bit more. Now, that's a fairly lengthy, I mean, here, let me, let me compare a 38 to a, you know, 38 to a 223. This is a rifle round. This is a handgun round. You'd think, wow, that 38's bigger, be more powerful. No. Um, there's not only... It can be the amount of gunpowder or the kind of gunpowder. There's all sorts of different kinds of gunpowder that have different uses and different uh, power production to them and things like that. And so the, the 38 is, is not an overly powerful round. Now, I should mention, um, we rented offices years and years ago from a guy who owned a gun store. And I remember he was an interesting fellow. And I remember him um, saying that he would rather be shot by a 357, which is 38, 37, very, very similar. 357 has more power to it. It's got more powerful round, but the, physically they're very similar in size. Um, he said, I'd rather be shot by a 357 than a 22. And it didn't take me long to figure out why. The 357 is going to leave a small hole in the front and a big hole in the back, and you stuff a rag in there to try to control the bleeding, and you get to the hospital, and you'll be fine. The 22 will go into you and then bounce off of stuff like a pinball machine. And just mess you up really badly. So it's not just a matter of how much power something delivers to the target. The, if, if the bullet's a full metal jacket, it's going to go through without expanding very much. And it's gonna, if it's an exit, go out the other side, all that power that the bullet still has has been wasted. It hasn't done anything to the target. And so it depends on where you hit, how you hit, what the bullet's uh, made of, uh, how heavy it is, angles, and there's just a million different things uh, that, that impact things. Police used to carry mainly a about a four-inch service special, 38. You can still see a lot of them in the 1950s, 1960s, TV programs, movies, stuff like that. Um, now, uh, what a lot of people, what a lot of cops are carrying will be Nine millimeter, and this happens to have a light and laser on it. Uh, but nine millimeter, with sometimes up to a seventeen round magazine, in it. and they'll have three or four of these with them in their vests that they're carrying. Now the nine mil looks like this. So I'll, if you want to compare it to the thirty eight. It's they're the, the, basically the same size across. The nine mil is got more kick to it. It's got a little more punch. And it's very common in the European nations, and that's why it became more common over here. And so a lot of cops have a have a nine mil. But I've talked to a lot of police officers, it doesn't have much stopping power. Less than the 38. And if you've got somebody on drugs, if you've got somebody on meth, um, I've seen video of cops literally emptying their nine mil into somebody. And the, the guy still got to him. And, and if 
And if that guy's a, got a knife on him, you're, you could be dead. And so there's been a lot of complaints about the nine mil. Now remember the nine mil is what Biden said could blow your lungs out. Um, again, he doesn't know, he has no idea what he's talking about. Nine mil is normally around 150 grains uh, slug, um, but it is nowhere near powerful enough to open up the hole the size of your lung in somebody's body. Um, that's just absurd. It just, it's just a lie. And how many people know it's a lie? That's one of the reasons I'm providing you some information. Uh, the next step up from a nine mil would be like a 40. It's got a lot more punch to it. Of course, the more punch you have, when you're holding a gun in your hand, your wrist has to deal with that recoil and get the front back on sight. And so the more, the heavier the, the recoil, the longer it takes you to get the second round out accurately and to control where it's going. You can go on YouTube right now and you can watch videos of bad guys and cops, both the semi-auto, nine mils, 40s, so on and so forth, 45s, um, on both on different end of a car, shooting at each other, emptying their guns and never hitting the other person. Part of that reason is that accuracy depends, well, Main reason for that's called adrenaline. <laughs> okay. You just want to be sending lead the other direction. You're not all that concerned about where it's going to go. You hope something hits before they hit you. Uh, it's it's panic, it's fear. It's the way it is. Movies normally miss all of that. Um and let me mention this before I forget it. This is a th 380. And there is a little 380. You can see the 380 in the magazine. It goes from here. This is the 380. Uh, this is a good gun to carry, like when riding a bike. Um, it's light, it's small, but look how short the barrel is. Because here's here's the the the, the cartridge is going to be sitting right there. So it might have an inch of barrel before it's out. Now, if you've only got about an inch, um, the you're not going to be accurate past about three or four feet. And the farther you go, the more variation you're going to get. And so, and so I remember, I remember a James Bond movie because what does James Bond care? Walter PPK, right? Um, if I'm, this is a Ruger, but I have a, I had a Walter. I've given many, many guns away. I, I used to have 44 Magnums and I gave them all away. One of them, man, I wish I had that one back. Gave it to somebody who didn't deserve it. Um, but anyway, um, uh, Bond is running, first of all, Next to impossible at anything while running, just, just so you know. Um, but Bond is running through like a courtyard. And there's a bad guy up on the roof about 40, 50 yards away. And Bond's got this little 380. <laughs> and while running, Blows him off the roof, kills him. Never gonna happen. I don't care how good a shot you are. There are some people that are really, 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 really good shots. They're they're really off. You can't do it. There simply is the, the laws of physics, and that short little barrel, when you aim it over there someplace, by the time it gets 40, 50 yards down the road, who knows where it's going. You certainly ain't going to know where it's going. Ain't going to happen. Can't do it. So keep that in mind. Uh, pistols are significantly less accurate the farther and farther you get away from somebody. Um, 
the rifle allows you to shoot at long distance. Um, and in many times with, with tremendous accuracy, though anyone who, you know, if you've watched this, you know, if you've watched the shooter movie, if you've watched uh, American Sniper uh, and stuff like that, you know, there's a lot that goes into it. And there, and it is, and it's a fascinating sport, long distance target shooting. It's a fascinating sport. It really is. There's no, no question about it. But once you get down to handguns, you got to be close. You really do. Now, I have a handgun. I'm not going to mention any more than that, that has a eight inch barrel. And you can literally mount a scope on it. And I'm accurate with that thing well past 50 yards. But that's because it's designed for that. Uh, but the vast majority of the semi auto, uh, you know, this little, you, you can see you've got what, two inches worth of barrel there? between where the bullet is starts its journey and when it's free to do its thing. And that's just only going to go so far. That's why, let me show you another one here. That's why you would have something like this. I bought this from my instructor um, when I took my concealed carry weapons permit class. This is a beautiful Ruger 22 slab side bull barrel target pistol. So it's 22, 22 long rifle. You see the slab size, it's flat on the sides, not round. It's got a heavy barrel to it and very accurate sights on the back. This is totally meant just for target shooting. Uh, I mean, could you use it in self defense? Well, if you had to. Um, you know, if you want to hit a particular button you know, or something like that, but it's meant for target shooting. And so look at how much longer the barrel is. That's going to give you that ability to have that more, bit more accuracy um, than you would have otherwise. What you will frequently see police carrying is the Glock. Now the Glock is one of the most reliable semi-automatic pistols made. There's no question about that. It's also the ugliest semi-automatic pistol made. It's, it ain't pretty. Um, but they've, they've dropped these things in rivers and buried them in sand and then pulled them up and emptied the, and, and, and it shoots just fine. Because when you think about it, this is a pretty simple mechanism. Um, you just got to get the ha the hammer to hit the, the primer and this is going to go off. Um, there's moving parts. And so jamming is a good way to die in a gunfight, obviously. Uh, the Glock is just very simple and it just works. The mine happens to have a, there's a little laser there. Um, there's a laser on the nine as well. I think that's an extra weapon to be honest with you because unless you're on drugs, if you have a laser beam pulsating between your eyes, that's where the bullet goes. So you might want to give up. <laughs> you might want to stop whatever you're doing. That Glock I showed you is a 45. Now, this is the 45 ACP. Uh, compare that to the nine millimeter. Yeah, yeah. This has stopping power. This has stopping power. You get hit with a 45, even if you're on heroin. I, I have seen, I've seen people on math and stuff like that and cop shot them the 45 and they, they kept coming, but generally it's significantly more effective along those lines. And if you, if you remember uh, in world war two, what did our guys carry on their side? It was a Colt model 1911 45 caliber pistol, semi-automatic pistol. And they, uh, if, if you want to see that really work out, watch We Were Soldiers. Mel Gibson's We Were Soldiers, one of the best Vietnam War movies ever. So well done. And the Sergeant Major, uh, Sam Elliott. Sam Elliott has played so many awesome plays, so many awesome parts. Um, he was that great general, uh, Buford. Uh, at the beginning of Gettysburg, 
Um, but then he was a sergeant major uh, and we were soldiers. And he didn't want an M16 because the M16 fires what? 223, 5.56. And they had just gone to that in Vietnam. And a lot of the old school guys are going, that is, that's a baby bullet. Uh, give me something that fires this. And so there's a scene where, where he's, he's like, no thanks. And he pulls his 45 and I'll use this. And he did. Uh, and, you know, one round down, one round down. Um, and, and that's the way a 45 generally, generally works. Um, but the recoil, go, the, the heavier the bullet, the more powerful it is, the more the recoil. So a lot of that, that 45 is really small. That's a small 45. So that means it kicks like a mule. Uh, a 1911 is much more controllable, but it's much heavier. So women, for example, tend to want something more like this. Um, though, I don't know if she's watching or not, I have video of my daughter, Summer, um, with an AMT Hardballer 45, which is a 1911. Uh, at the range, and um, she much preferred the the heavier gun uh, with the with the kick uh, to anything smaller. She was much more accurate with that. So, really, all depends on the individual and and how you handle recoil. One other to show you here: this is a Derringer. This is a 22 long rifle. They also make a 22 Magnum version. 22 Magnum. 22 Magnum has the foot pound energy of a 38. Keep that in mind. But this is called a belly gun because if you're not basically putting it in someone's belly, you're probably not going to hit them with it. Uh, three rounds. No, it's like four. That might five. Actually, this uh, this one removes. I'll have to look. One, two. Three, four, five, five rounds. See that you can do that with a 22 because the cylinder doesn't have to really hold much explosive energy. You start getting into 44, stuff like that, you really have to have a lot of metal there to hold the amount of power that is being generated in the explosion when, when the gun goes off. Um, the big issue today is this magazines. This is a magazine for an air. Air 15. There's your 5.56. This one can hold up to 40 rounds. That's the issue. That's the big, the big thing. And because you can send a lot of lead down field very, very quickly uh, with something along those lines. Obviously, in a tight situation, in a home or something like that, it's hard to have a rifle because how do you how do you turn around without hitting the wall stuff like that? Um, there's a lot of uh, of discussion that goes on along those lines. Um, so I've explained a lot of basic stuff uh, because in my experience, the people that I'm talking to in our society don't know anything about these things. They they know nothing about them at all. I've, I, I cannot tell you how many people I've met who thought this is what comes out the end of the barrel. They didn't know, okay, this is the brass, you know, there's your primer, uh, the, the gunpowder is in here. You can actually, if you, you can't see it there, but you can actually see how deep this is seated. It goes to right there. So that's all the slug. That's what comes out. This gets ejected out of the gun and can be reused, by the way. Uh, as I did very, very often um, in reloading and, and, and using again. But people just, they just don't know. And so when people uh, lie to them on the internet, on uh, social media, on television programs, they accept the lies. They don't know enough to go, what? Nine mil is medium power, 
uh, in comparison to 45 and no. Uh, and and what, what, what are you talking about? And uh, 223, decapitating a dog. It was, it was like it exploded, the whole world exploded around me. And it's, you can literally, I wouldn't recommend it, but you can, well, the 22, my, my, my 22 over there, you didn't need hearing protection. Not loud enough to require it. You know, the AR should, yeah, but you could get away without using without any issues. I mean, <laughs> when I took Betsy uh, with a 338 wind mag, uh, I did not have hearing protection on when you're hunting. Um, that was loud. That was really, really loud. Let me tell you. A repeated exposure to that will deafen you. There's no, no question about it. 223, we're, we're, we're being lied to. And the looks, you see, you could have one of those hunting rifles with a magazine on it, with 223s in it. And there is functionally no difference between it and an AR-15. Why is the AR-15 a weapon of war, but the hunting is not? It's because of what it looks like. And there's video over and over, all over the place of these senators and, how, and representatives. And when they're asked what a shroud is, they have no idea. Uh, they, they do not understand how these weapons work. How can they write legislation that has any relevance if they have no idea what it is they're talking about? It is, th these people are not doing anything to stop gun violence. Um, obviously, just look at Chicago, Detroit, uh, Los Angeles, New York, um, Houston, add up the body count from this last weekend because it always starts with Memorial Day. And then keep the body count going. Far more people died over the weekend in gang-related violence in those cities than died at Uvalde. Now, they were kids. That, that's what makes it horrible. And that's what, that's what makes it absolutely necessary for all of us to go, why have we already been told three different stories and we're getting a fourth one now? And why aren't we getting direct answers to obvious questions? There should be a reason for all of that. But I go back to where I started. Um, let me show you something that is illegal on the streets of London. It's called a butterfly knife. This one's rather colorful, isn't it? Um, I have a friend that can whip this thing around and everything else without cutting himself. I've thought about trying to learn to do that, but I just, I like my fingers where they are. <laughs> so, um, you can't carry a knife in London. Um, once they get rid of all these, then they go for these. Because it's already happening. Where they've already gotten all these, then they go for these. And who gives these things up? The law-abiding citizen. The people that don't want to be criminals. But what does that make you? It makes you defenseless. Well, you can just call the state-sponsored prayer line, 911. Because when seconds matter, the police are only minutes away. If they're even coming. These days... That was, that was a funny joke before. If there's no blood, they're not going to show up. And we've seen that situation already numerous times. And the, and the people disarming us, they're not disarmed. They're not disarming themselves. They're not disarming their bodyguards. Uh, we, did you see the, the Davos police force? Fully armed, body armored police force at Davos for the World Economic Forum? They've got their own police force, and they are armed, but they want you disarmed because you can't be trusted, but they can be because they're tyrants. And you don't give slaves a way to defend themselves. So you can't, you can't carry something like this in many places now. 
Um, if you wa ever watched NCIS, you know that one of Gibbs' rules, forget which one it was, seven or nine, I think, was never leave home without your knife. Um, this is a Ravencrest. It's fully legal. Some of you are going, ah! It's amazing how people freak out about stuff that they don't understand. I'm afraid of that. I primarily use this to open Amazon boxes, okay? It's good on letters when I have to open a letter. I don't have to open letters very much anymore. But it's really good on Amazon boxes. It really does. Um, a lot of cops carry these. It's a local company, by the way. They're out actually within about two miles of where Paul G is currently meeting. Ravencrest Tactical, really well-made knives. It's got, it's got a real solid feel to it. And the, blood, the blades hold real good. Um, good thing to have as a, as a backup um, plan because once they get the guns, then uh, that's, all, that's all you've got left. It is obvious there, there are over estimates. I mean, nobody knows how many guns there are in the United States, but there, there are estimates that there are more guns than there are people. And look at something like this. We can't stop people from passing fentanyl around and cocaine and heroin. You're supposed to get all these. You're, you're supposed to find all of these. It's not going to happen. So there have already been Uh, I just saw something from Rich. Uh, just says now, did you talk about the 21 foot rule? I have no earthly idea what that is. Um, I have a feeling I know what it is. I think it has something to do, yeah, that knives are more effective within a certain range than guns are uh, because of the probability of getting missed, of, of missing. You know, you've, you've heard the saying, don't bring a knife to a gunfight depends on what the range is. <laughs> um, uh, knives can be incredibly effective and extremely dangerous. And I've seen far too many videos of officers who um, were either killed or severely injured because even though the person didn't have a gun. And that's the other thing. People say, well, a cop shouldn't shoot somebody who's only got a knife. Really? You ever seen the damage a knife can do? Oh, my goodness. Um, again, uh, by, and by the way, more people are killed by knives in the United States than by long rifles. Pistols, they are the gang member's friend, but so are knives and baseball bats. And yet, what are they going after? They're going after the AR-15. Why? Because that's what they're afraid of. Slaves can't be allowed to own that. They can't be allowed to own that. Tyrants fear have tyrants fear their people having that. The, the people who founded this nation didn't fear their people having weapons. They encouraged it because they weren't trying to be tyrants. But if you want to be a tyrant, now, why all of this discussion? Like I said at the beginning, I had people contacting me during the lockdown saying, man, I see the advantage you guys have. That was before the COVID camps. And that was before the videos started coming out of what's going on in China. When you see the tiny little boxes that people are being locked in, you hear the screaming. You see people jumping out of windows in high-rise buildings where they have been locked in. You realize that only happens in places where the populace has been disarmed. It's happening in Australia because the populace has been disarmed. It will happen in Canada because the populace is being disarmed. The people at Davos, the Bill Gateses of the world, who want to know where you are and what you're doing at every moment and control all of it and are intent upon doing so, know that that's never going to happen as long as people have access to these. 
And I've seen memes where someone said, anybody who says that the Second Amendment is about being able to fight off the government, have you ever seen an Abrams tank? Yes, I have. They've only produced 8,300 of them. Not all of them are in service right now. There's only a certain number of them, and they have to be manned by a certain crew. And there's no question that if the government brings the military to bear, me and my AR-15 is toast. No question about it at all. But they have to declare war on their own people. Now, there's a lot of jackbooted thugs that will still do it. No question about it. We certainly learned that over the past couple of years. But I simply have to ask you a question. We've been talking a lot about loving your neighbor. What are you going to do when they come to your door and they are going to inject your children with poison or they're going to take them away? One of the two. What do you do? You have a decision to make. You can give your children to death and to the state. Or if you want to rescue the perishing, if you want to stand for what is true and just, you'll make them pay for it. There's only so many of them. They're actually a small minority. And most of them are cowards. So if, if you would protect those you've been told to protect, um, things might change. Things might change. But you don't have a choice if you're disarmed. We live in a nation, I'm speaking to Americans right now, we live in a nation where we still have the possibility of turning things around, of uh, electing people who will do what is right in regards to freedom. It is pro-life to protect life against evil. Just as we seek to protect innocent life in the womb, when someone, as the Bible says, seeks to take the lives of another, their life should be taken. I remember years ago, I've been consistent on this issue. I remember years ago uh, responding to John Piper on this issue. He came out saying if someone broke into his home, he would not defend himself or his wife. And I said, you're wrong. And here's why, biblically. You're wrong. That's, that's, not, that's not how you should do things. Um, and so I've been consistent about this. I'm not telling you what your conclusion has to be. There are some people who are just simply scared to death of a firearm. Okay, well, then you probably should stay away from one. In fact, anyone who's not trained to safely handle one should stay away from it. But there's an irrational level of fear that many people have. And as a result, a large number of people are simply ignorant. That includes Christians. I know, I know Christian brothers. We were all raised differently. Maybe, you know, I was raised in Arizona. You could jump in a car and go shooting. You are raised in the city, and that just wasn't part of your experience. I get it. I've never been fishing. I mean, yeah, there are some lakes in, in Arizona. They're all man-made, just about. And it's just this has never been one of my things. So, so we're all different. Fine. But you're being lied to, and you should know when you're being lied to. At the very, very least, if you've stuck with me this long, hopefully you've learned a little something about what these things actually are, how they function, and to recognize that almost anything that you're hearing from a media source when it comes to the subject of guns is being written by people who are completely ignorant and they don't care. They're repeating lies, whether they know it or not, it doesn't matter, and they don't care whether it matters or not. And so hopefully that's been helpful to you. Um, if you choose to defend your wife and your children and your grandchildren from evil men set on their destruction, um, we in America still have the right to do that. 
whether we will continue to have that right. That right requires a responsible people, and I don't know that there are many responsible people left. I'll be honest about that. But um, the people who want to take over are even less responsible. So there's that. Those are the issues that we're facing. They are complicated issues. But you can't address complicated issues if you're running on complete lies at the foundation. So some people may ask, so do you go shooting every? No, nope, I haven't been shooting in a couple of years. Not because I would not enjoy doing so. It's very relaxing. It's a lot of fun. But ammunition is now ridiculously expensive. If you want to shoot outdoors, I have to drive forever. And that's ridiculously expensive. Uh, there are indoor shooting ranges. But I'll be honest with you. I'm holding on to what I've got <laughs> as far as uh, ammunition goes. Because I just have a feeling. Um, and if everything goes topsy-turvy, um, there are going to be those people that can defend themselves and their loved ones and those that can't. That's going to be the issue that uh, everyone's going to be going to be facing. So anyways, um, that was an unusual one, wasn't it? And I took a risk. I know I took a risk. I said that at the beginning. Uh, there are people who will never listen to me again just simply because I have factually and accurately laid out what these things are, how they work, how to rate the various powers that, that, that they possess as far as stopping power and recoil and stuff like that. You're, you have an irrational fear. And other people have rational fears of knives. I'm not sure why you have a rational fear of cars. You might. They're a deadly weapon too. There are people, I guess, that do. Um, I get that. But my hope, my, my biggest hope is that for a lot of people, it would be like, wow, I learned a few things. And man, now I, I can really see. And, and, and right now, you can really, really see. I'm being lied to right, left, and center. Uh, and hopefully you don't want to be lied to, or you at least want to know when you are being lied to. And hopefully I've been able to help you to recognize that. So there you go. And um, that's why we did the program today. Uh, we've got lots and lots of other things to be looking at that we will get to that hopefully I can uh, do. Um, <laughs> just looking at someone. Interesting. So, so all Christians through all the way up to today were Christian Platonists. I just read Ian Clary saying that they're Christian Platonists. So I guess Paul was influenced by Plato. Really? The fathers were Christian Platonists. Oh, so I'm sorry, but that's just silly. Was Justin Martyr influenced by Plato? Duh. Why did, why did, why did Tertullian say what does Jerusalem have to do with Athens? You're going to put those two together? That kind of, the, sim, the simplistic attempt on the part of certain people today to paint church history in, in a way that is just, just levels everything out. Maybe one of the things we need to be talking about next time on The Dividing Line. Thanks for watching. Hope it was helpful to you. We'll see you next time. God bless you.